Isaiah 14. We're looking at verses uh, 12 through 15. Isaiah 14. Verse 12 through 15. Now, for, before we start, uh, flip back to chapter 13 for a moment. 13. And 13. Cha chap no, I just want you to look at it. Are you at chapter 13? Yeah. Now, if you have a study Bible, they'll say something about, they should say something like, the heading of it should be like the prophecy of Babylon or the king of Babylon. Have you got that? Okay, it should be the prophecy about Babylon or the king of Babylon. This starts in verse thir uh, chapter 13. It goes through 14, right? And um, just to show you something, look at chapter 15. Then we got, now we have a prophecy about Moab, and then we're going to have, and it's going to go on. All right, so what we're in is a book of prophecies about nations and, uh, and Christ. And you're going to learn something tonight about parallel prophecies, parallel prophecies. You'll never understand what we're going to say tonight without having a grasp of parallel prophecies. Prophecies that are in parallel. Uh, and th this is, uh, we're in a subject of uh, angelic conflict. We're going to deal with I, uh, Isaiah 14, and we're going to deal with Ezekiel 28. And it's very important, and we'll teach you that tonight, but this is very important that you learn this. Parallel prophecy, uh, what we refer to uh, when we look at passages like this, parallel prophecy uh, messianic. But tonight is going to be unique because he's going to talk about parallel prophecies of the nation of Babylon um, and the king and compare it to Lucifer or Satan, which makes this really interesting. So <clears throat> in the angelic conflict, that's the spiritual warfare. Now, now we're in verse 12. All right. To kind of give, give you just kind of a background uh, we call that isagogics in theology. We, ice teaching, isagogic, categoric, and exogeny. So I just gave you a little bit of, of that. Uh, now verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of dawn. Now, if you have a King James Bible or one of the translations that come off from the King James translators, you will have the word Lucifer. Okay? Lucifer. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a Lucifer. And, and th they're correct. Uh, the di but what they did is the star of the morning, the Hebrew word, Hallel, they took that and translated it uh, from uh, Hebrew and Septuagint Greek uh, into Latin. The word Lucifer is Latin for the word morning star the star of the morning we'll see that in a moment i'm just telling you because some people have king james version you're going to where it says where it says star of the morning your bible's going to call it lucifer and they're correct um how you have fallen from heaven o star of the morning son of the dawn you have been cut down to earth you who have weakened the nations and he's and he's talking about satan a title of satan concept of Satan but you said in your heart and and here's the famous I five I wills that caused Satan to rebel against God's plan in eternity past at the eternal life conference but you said in your heart I will ascend to the heavens I will raise my throne throne uh, I will raise my throne above the stars of God that's the angelic world I will sit on the uh, mount of the assembly that's that's the authority system of heaven in the recesses of the north i will ascend above the heights of the clouds i will make myself like the most high that's el elyon most high 
when you when you find it, you find this phrase used with Jesus Christ often in uh, the in story of the incarnation. That's a, that's a big deal when he says, uh, "I will make myself like the Most High." He's talking about the Most High God. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Uh, that's where fallen angels go and are kept until the lake of fire or until the plan of God recalls them. Okay. I mean, you would know this. Maybe if you look, had a reference Bible and they would give you cross references and then you would wind up in Revelation. You would wind up in Genesis 6 and, and you would wind up in Revelation 9. And, and then the pieces would begin to fall together for you about the devil, Satan. Or in this case, I kept the term Lucifer just to make a distinction. Now that's a very clear. Almost everybody understands when you're talking about Lucifer, you're talking about Satan. And so rather than say the star of the morning, because you're going to see that prophetically that can get you in a little bit. I mean, Jesus Christ is called this. And uh, that's where, and, and we talked about last week, the origin of the angelic conflict began the eternity to pass, the eternal life conference. When God laid out his plan and put, he put Christ as the centerpiece of the plan. And this is where this all started. Well, and then later, I want, I want to stay on this part, but later we'll go to Ezekiel uh, 28 and look at that passage. What we're talking about, the angelic conflict, where did it come from? How did it start? Because we're in the midst of it. And for example, when Paul talks about the spiritual warfare of Ephesians 6 and tells you to put on the full armor of God, the way he introduced that whole subject matter was about the spiritual warfare in verse 11. Spiritual politics, you know. Uh, so he goes through a whole list of ways uh, under the authority of Satan how he attacks. And what, what is he after? What, who, who, who's his primary target? It always is who, whoever represents Christ on earth. So it's the church. And who is the church? The believers. Those who believe that Jesus died for their sin was buried and raised from the dead on third day, which is the gospel. When you believe that, Romans 1.16 says, the, the gospel is the power of God. And the, listen, the gospel, which is Jesus Christ, Christ died for your sins. He dies for your sin. He's buried and he's raised from the dead. They call that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When you believe that as a source of your salvation, when you believe that as a source of not just believe it because you think it really happened, but to believe it as a source of your salvation, then he says, then that gospel has the, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. When you believe that, you get saved. Not by yourself, not of yourself, but by the gospel. And then Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace we are saved through faith and not of herself is a gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. All the boast goes to God because he did all the work, you did zero. All right? And so th this is an important feature. So once you become a believer in the church age, you become a believer, a Christian, or one that belongs to Christ, you become the target. Y you are always going to be the target in the angelic complex. You are the target. Prior to Christ coming to dine on the cross, then he was the target. Agreed? He was the target. Afterwards, then, it's all these little Jesus people running around uh, promoting him, right? <laughs> Called Christians. So we need to be onward Christian soldiers, don't we? Because we're in a real war. And uh, we're the target. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Before we start, remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it in carnality, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sins. It could be in three categories. It could be mental attitude sins, anger, hate, bitterness. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. What do I do about it? Well, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, then he is faithful, God is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us because of the work of Christ on the cross in the first chapter, verse 7, we just quoted verse 9, 1 John 1, 9. 
because of the propitious work of Christ on the cross, this is extended to the believer's life, not by believing the gospel, but by confessing the sin to restore us to the ministry of the Holy Spirit because the moment we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because we live in the church age, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside our body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and our body became the temple of God because it was bought. Your body doesn't belong to you anymore. It was bought by the blood of Christ on the cross for the Holy Spirit to dwell there. And he is what makes spirituality work. It's not done in the flesh. It's done in the power of the Spirit. So, in order to study the Bible and get a learning part of this, so we can have a learning part of it, with learning to living, then we got to be sure that we have no unconfessed sins so the Holy Spirit can teach us truth because he hit one of the titles he has, the Spirit of Truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth, the truth of what? Set you free. Well, we all need to be set free. And we can be set free uh, to understand the angelic conflict and know that we are victors and not victims. You're going to be one of two in the angelic conflict. You're either going to be a victim or a victor. Christ established everything in our life, indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Word of God is the sword, the sword that slays him every time when he, when he, when he combats us, co comes against us or combats us. So, um, you know, and where does the strength come to wield that sword destructively against him? Comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're a priest. that You take care of your own responsibilities. 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9. Confess your sins and study the word and let the word study you and become a warrior for Christ. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these come our way by automobile and by internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls. I pray those home on the internet or wherever they are, hotels or wherever they are, that they would concentrate for the next hour with us, shut off any device that would distract them, and focus on what the word of God is going to teach them under the ministry that focus. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. If you're visiting with us on Wednesday, stay on this course with us. Stay on the Wednesday with us for a year. At least stay on it through the course. We're going to do many studies on the angelic conflict. You're going to, know, you're going to need to know every one of them. We're at lesson two. So go to our internet. Father, we thank you for all that your grace provides for us. And we pray that even now, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister in our hearts the need for the truth that can set us free and cause us to be victors and not victims in the angelic conflict. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this is lesson two. We talked about the origin of it last week. You can go to our, our website and should be able to pick that up uh, off our web. Uh, point number one. Uh, the fall of Lucifer is what we're talking about both in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel. Uh, write these three passages down. You, you want to become very familiar. You, you want Isaiah 14, you want Ezekiel 28, and you want Revelation 12. Those are the three key passages on this angelic conflict, and they're, they're, and they're, they're important. Um, the fall of Lucifer... As recorded in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, says how you have fallen from heaven. Now, we're way past a king with that idea. But remember that these are prophecies against the nation of Babylon because God used them to put the fifth under Israel. And there's going to be judgment for that, uh, even though he promoted it. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. The word morning star is Hallel. And uh, I wrote the Hebrew word. Remember, you, in Hebrew, you read uh, from, from right to left. And that word in Hebrew means shining one and is transliterated as Lucifer in the King James. Uh, and uh, rightly so, because that's what it means. That's Latin, then called son of the dawn or morning. Okay. Uh, uh, son of the morning. You have been cast down to earth. Okay, 
Lucifer is the Latin translation of the Hebrew word uh, that comes from the Latin Vulgate Bible. The translator of the King James Bible used this word Lucifer as a descriptive title of Satan. Okay? And rightly so. Uh, Jesus uh, refers to this fall of Satan, if you'll go with me for a moment, keep, keep your Isaiah passage, and go with me to Luke for a minute. He makes reference. And always Jesus is teaching the Bible, and he makes a reference here in 10. Um, and when you're reading verses 17, uh, ver 10, is beginning with 17, uh, he has said, look at 10.1 and then 10.17. Look at 10.1. After the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two and two ahead of him in every sitting place, he sent 70 missionaries out in teams of two. Are you with me? And they've gone out and, and from there through verse 16, he gives them instructions on their mission trip. He gives them, that's all the description. You can read that on your own, but he, he lays out what he wants them to do on this mission trip and where the authority to do these things will come from. Now we get to verse 17. They've returned. The 70 returned and uh, with joy, and they said, Lord, even the demons, that's fallen angels, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Are you with me? Look what he says in verse 18. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority. And then he goes on to what he says, and then he goes on to a discussion on that. I want you to pay attention to verse 18, what he just said. Now, I'm going to have to help you with that a little bit. So look on your paper. Look on your paper, verse 18. I put on your paper, I want to help you with that. I want you to help you to see what he said. Okay? He said, I was watching. It's an imperfect act of indicative. Okay? Let me start with the word, thereo. It means that a spectator, this is a spectator that's gone to a specific event with an idea of gathering specific details. That's important. Okay? F looking for specific details of that event. Uh, in football, this might be a scout, scouting another team, a guy on defense. You've got one guy, if he scouts, you've got a defense guy, he scouts only defense. You have another guy, he scouts only offense, and another guy, he scouts only special teams. Right? Alan? Yeah? Yeah? If they got that kind of manpower, and if they don't, they try to find uh, parents, somebody who played football, somebody got it, and they bring them in, teach them how to scout, right? Yeah, that's what you do. Now, if you're in Alabama, you can afford to pay them pretty good salaries to do this, or Auburn. But they go to that game. They're not, listen, if you want to watch the game, then you get it online. You get, you, you get the recording of it and come back, because I didn't send you to watch the ball game and enjoy it, right? You can, get, you can get tapes and see it later. You, uh, you, so that's what this word means. <clears throat> uh, during, the sp during the spring, let's see. Yeah, during the spring, um, J Jane was up to a little bit of traveling, so we went over and watched Billy play a spring game against um, Vestavia or somebody. They're like that. I forget now who they played. Uh, Chelsea playing Vestavia, I believe, in a spring game uh, type thing. Well, what do you think, Grandma, wh wh what do you think the whole game for Grandma was about? Ty? I don't know how many times she asked me what her, his number was. <laughs> he plays center, but his number is 65. I kept going like, can't be possibly, he can't play center and be have a number 65. Billy said, Dad, you're old school. <laughs> back, back in my day, you knew if, some, if somebody had a 50 number, he, he, he was on center. If he had 60, he was guard, and so it went. 
we had those, you knew where people were, but it wasn't true. And so I was get a little confused at the beginning because I kept looking for 50 numbers and he had a 65 because his grandfather, his grandfather on the side, other side of the family and uncle Dan both played and both played guard and had the number 65. And there was no other number he was going to have if he could have it. And his ideal idea was to go to Chelsea and play guard as a third generation guard. And they couldn't find a center, so they moved him, and he did, but they moved him from guard to center. And actually, he loves it. But so we, so when we took, when we went to the ball game, well, I could watch all the game, even when he was an offense, when he was not on the game, grandma was still looking for him. I said, look, he's not out there now. This is defense time. I don't care what they're doing right now. <laughs> That's this word watching, okay? I went a long way to tell you that, but that's this word watching. I was watching, and that's important. This is not somebody just gazing around, you know. This is specific, and so that's important. That's the first thing that's important about that. I was watching, and so I put the Greek word there so you could, you could grab this. The second thing's important is imperfect tense. The imperfect tense in the Greek language means continuous action to pass time. Something happened to bring you into this event that, that is carrying this into this event. For us, it was Ty as a grandkid who has now gone to high school, has made the football team, is playing. Okay? Now, we wouldn't went to that ball game had Ty not been playing. Right? There's no way we'd have drove out there and sat and all that stuff and ate that crazy food. Uh, you remember when your kids went to the Little League Park? Remember those days? You just ate all that stuff and, oh, my goodness. When my kids said, I don't think I want to play this year, I said, oh, that's sad. Uh, I jumped up. And inside of me, I was going like, yeah, da 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 well, we, you know, like most parents, we live there every Saturday and practice every other day or whatever. Continuation with action to pastime. And, and listen, what, what the imperfect tense does, listen to me now, this is important. It, it's designed to paint a picture. A picture that started in the past, we now we're putting really pieces to it. You know, you, you have an idea and you put it out there and you outline it and then you start putting it, all the stuff together. This is like painting a picture or telling a story that is in chapters. That's the imperfect tense. So I saw, I saw what? I saw Satan fall and it's an aorist tense. So he's talking about something out of the past that he has a frame of reference for that he's looking for details now about that has a specific point in his life and history. Aorist tense is the most unique tense you'll ever see in any language. It's a point in time divorced from time. It's, a, it's an aorist tense. It's a past tense that brings a point into, into existence. It, it's just the most incredible thing in the world. And I, I, I'm going to bring it. And so it's a past point of beginning. Something going on, past point of beginning. And so he said, I, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And so, listen, he, the interesting thing, he's been on both planes. He was in eternity past when Satan led this rebellion and God put him down. And saw him fall like lightning when God cast him out to the earth. And now he's brought that history back in and now he's fulfilling another chapter in the history of the angelic conflict. Now, listen, from that point all the way up to the incarnation of Christ, Satan has been fighting the seed of Christ all the way through history, hasn't he? I mean, even, even, even Herod, you know, Herod goes out and kills all the kids two and under. Looking for one child, he kills them all looking for one. And so he sends his disciples out and and he, he says, I was watching 
Satan fall from heaven. From heaven like lightning. That's just interesting. It's just, I don't know if you can see all that, but that's why I'm your teacher. Jesus was teaching on this very subject to his disciples of the angelic conflict and on why the fallen angels, demons, were subject to his authority. Because he's the centerpiece of the plan of God. He's, we would say he's the man. He's the man. The connection of the imperfect to the aorist in this, in this tells the story of the angelic com conflict from the past to the present to the future. The future, if you're interested in looking ahead because you have the Bible, you can read about it in Revelation 20.10. That's the future where he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. I mean, what other book in the whole wide world could give you that kind of perspective about anything? When we talk about the past, we're talking about eternal life conference to the present, to the future. That's the story of our life, too, and God. You know that, don't you? I mean, Alpha and Omega, huh? Alpha and Omega, from the beginning to the end, first to last. Christ is everything. Not only is it first to last, but he's everything in between. <laughs> Whew, uh. Here's the second point. Another reason for the change from morning star to Lucifer was because the morning star was a messianic title. Messianic title. Revelation 22, 22, 16 on your paper. I, Jesus, have sent my angels. Now, we're in Revelation 22 when he says this. We're in the new heaven and new earth stuff. Right? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for, for the church, churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Now, I'm going to show you the Greek because it's important. Because this is unique. Satan couldn't, this is not what he was called over here, morning star. That's an angelic uh, identity. When Jesus says this, listen to me now, this is important. In Matthew, in, in uh, Revelation 22, listen to me now. He's talking about the, hum the hypostatic humanity of Jesus Christ. How do I know it? The root and descendant of David, right? I mean, he's got to be the son of man and the son of God in one unique person. He's got a hypostatic unity. He's got to be undiminished deity and true humanity in one unique man of the universe. He's got to do that to qualify to go to the cross. He's got to be born outside Adamic sin. He's got to qualify by, by being impeccable to go to the cross to die for our sins, not his. Notice I, I gave you, there are three, the word whole. See the word whole? When it says the bright morning star, whole aster. The aster, see the word whole. Each time you see the word whole, that's a definite article, the. The aster is the word for star in a Greek. Then lampus is the word where we get the word lamp or shining light. And then we have the word apoidos, uh, which is the word dawn or morning. And, and so when he says the bright morning star, see, that's not the word in the Greek that was used for over here, in like in the Septuagint. That, when they translated this, this word H-E-L-E-L -E -L, into the Greek language, this is not the same words. It's a completely different Greek word idea. So this, I'm just showing you that there was a morning star that was identified in eternity past that was identified with Satan that's not identified with Jesus Christ technically, but yet they have the same names. And listen, the devil would like to tell you he is equal with them. You must never let him have a foot. Like, like Ephesians 4th chapter says, don't let him have a foothold. Don't give him the opportunity to put his foot in the door. Hmm? 
don't give them any opportunities. These three messianic terms, root, descendant, and morning, bright morning star, were fulfilled by Jesus Christ by his incarnation, his hypostatic union, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension and session, all of that, all wrapped up. Matthew uh, 5.17, he, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. That He's got to do that. Romans 10.17, he said, I'm the end of the law. Luke 24, listen, Luke, that Luke 24.44 is worth your read one day. You should read that. Not now, but later. That's a good read. You know, on the road to Emmaus, remember that? that met the two disciples, and he tells them some things. That's one of the things he tells them is dynamite. <clears throat> uh, number three, Satan is a master disguiser. Boy, you've got to know that. But he's not going to confront you as himself. Hi, I'm the devil. You know, the, you know, the guy with the, the horns and the pitchfork and dressed in red. Do you remember that? <clears throat> He's not going to come on like Dante's Inferno with you. <clears throat> but he's going to, he is going to hit you. He's going to hit you in your blind side. Now, the disguise is not for him. It's for you. It, man. <clears throat> but understand, he never presents himself as himself. <clears throat> he always disguises who he is. He never presents himself as himself, but as a shining light of God's truth. He did it with Eve, didn't he, in the garden? <clears throat> and he does it with you and he does it with me. And we've got to be careful about that. <clears throat> so in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, he does it. <clears throat> Revelation 20, chapter verse 2, he talks, it's a descriptive title given to him about it. And the real thing is, I want you to put your eyes on this. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 with me. And I, I, I want you to see this so that he doesn't, he doesn't hoodwink us. As uh, my grandfather used to say, don't let him hoodwink you, son. Don't let him hoodwink you. 11th chapter, I want, you to show, I want to show you three things. Because I don't want you to be deceived and beguiled and all this stuff. 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves. Watch the word disguise used three times. Disguise them themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, once he was that, now he has to disguise it because he lost it in the fall. So he has to disguise himself. Once he didn't have to disguise, that's who he was, right? What was he called? Star of the morning, morning star. Now he has to disguise himself, and he disguises himself as an angel of light. Well, he says, look, look, I used to be one. I, I have empathy with you. I used to be one. Listen, come join my team. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants, those that he has beguiled and deceived, his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end shall be according to their deeds. Eh? See the word disguise? Used three times, three different ways, but all connected. So let's take that idea. For example, in 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan is referred to as a roaring lion, right? Doing what? Stalking, stalking people to devour. Okay, Jesus is called the Lion of Judah, right? The Lion of Judah, the Lion that is of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5, 5, lion, the Lion that is of the tribe of Judah, 
the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and his seven seals, and then we're off to the races. That's tribu tribulational speech. <clears throat> Not only that, but look, Satan is described as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The story of Little Red Riding Hood. Matthew 7, 15, and of course, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, we just read. Who is Jesus? He's the Lamb of God that's come to the world to take away their sin, right? Take away the sin of the world. He's called the Lamb of God. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we're told that he is a lamb without blemish and spot. That, that qualifies his blood to be precious. Precious, the blood of Christ, precious to save us. Now, point number four. Here's where you need to understand something that's really important about Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 that people miss. They go in there and they look at Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and they say, well, this can't possibly be talking about Satan because we're talking about a na two nations and their kings and their authority. All right? What they miss when they do that, theologians, what they miss is they miss parallel prophecies. I just gave you an example of some parallels, right? Lion, lion. I mean, what's he always trying to do? Disguise himself as an angel of light. So he's always, so he, he, he as soon as the teachers are teaching, cranking it out, then he becomes, then he becomes a teacher of, you know, of the, of the Bible and all that. He, 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 he listen, he, he's dumb as a brick. He got, he got, he's got, he can't ever create anything, right? can't create anything except chaos so he has to copy everything he's a disguiser he's he always disguises himself as something that is that you're familiar with that he can deceive you by do you not understand that you're gonna get you're gonna get caught eve all right so parallel messianic prophecy or parallel prophecies Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are classic examples of it. So let's go back to Isaiah a moment. Put your eyes on Isaiah. And why this is not the king, even though the chapter 13 and 14 are about it and Babylon, he pauses in the middle to show that Babylon was used as a tool in the angelic conflict. That's what this is about. But it's obvious to the average reader, if he understands a little bit about the angelic conflict, how this parallel prophecy works. Um, have you got it? I want you to hold it there, and we'll look at it a moment. First, I want to show you parallel prophecy that everybody would know. Here's one. In the story of Jonah, right? We got Jonah. And we believe he's a real person, a real time at some point going. In the first chapter, verse 17, the last verse of the first chapter, we're told that Jonah is going to be three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster in the Mediterranean Sea. That is brought out by Jesus in Matthew, the 12th chapter, 38 through 40, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale of the belly, uh, the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man, right, be in the heart of the earth. I mean, Jesus can't die on Friday, be buried on Saturday and raised on Sunday and be someplace in the belly of a whale for three days. And what he's talking about is Sheol. <clears throat> so we call that parallel prophecy, right? Yeah. That's parallel prophecy. You also have it with Egypt to Christ in Hosea 1 compared to Matthew 2, 13, 15. Moses to Christ in Deuteronomy 15 brought out in Acts 3. I put all that on your paper, okay? I just gave you one illustration most people really do understand, and that was the one of Jonah. You can read the others, but these are, these are parallel prophecies, okay? Now, when we come to Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 28, we have the same thing. So you got your Bibles open to 14. Now, I, I did some of this. Notice on your paper, uh, on the, I'm on the right side of your paper. 
uh, under point five, looking at parallel po po uh, prophecy, I meant I, I went to the right side. So look, if, as we go through, let's look at verse twelve. Let me let me get back to Isaiah fourteen, twelve. How you have fallen from heaven. I, I don't think that's any king that Babylon had. Would you agree with that? Fall from heaven? He might have fallen out of the top bal balcony or something. But uh, an O star of the morning, son of the dawn? Or a tree. Or a tree. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't bring that up. Uh, th that's another one. Here's, a, here's a, a third one. You have been cut down to earth. Uh, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, and then he, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend uh, above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, which is his big motive. When he heard, when he sat and listened to God lay out his plan and, and, and everything, he realized that whoever had that centerpiece was going to hold one day all of the authority absolute authority and that person would be the most high God we know that person was the son of the most high God and when this whole thing is over the son is going to turn it back to the most high God and Satan wanted that position. He wanted to be able to rule the creative universe was his goal. That's why he tried to overthrow the authority, the assembly, that, that is the divine structure of, of the heaven. He tried to overthrow that in a revolt for that reason. And I'll tell you something. He has lowered his expectations today because he got whipped pretty good. Michael did a number on him. He got him pretty good. But you know what his ambition is today? You see it when he attacked Christ in Matthew 4. He wants earthly, global worship as the God of this world. First, first John 5, 19. Matthew 4, 11. You know what he said to Jesus? What his whole, he attacked Jesus three times. You know what he wanted to do? Bow down and worship him, and he'd give him whatever he wanted. Listen, he already had more than the devil could ever promise him. See, that's true with you too. See, he tries to get you with a little cheese on a trap. He don't give you the whole big chunk of cheese. He gives you just enough to get you into the trap where he can get you. He don't have anything to give you that you don't already have. And what he's got is just peanuts, cheese, maybe cheese and peanuts. I'm not quite sure. Okay. And so you always pay attention to the three, the, the, the five I wills. It's all about ascending to heaven and being the number one guy. I, I want to replace the most high. I want the place of the, I want the place of the most high. Now, when you go to Ezekiel, let's, let's roll over to Ezekiel in a moment. Not too far away. Ezekiel 28. He gets in pretty lengthy here. And we're in the same thing. Um, in verse, look, if you look at chapter 26, we're, we're in the judgment on Tyre. The lament, verse, chapter 27, the lament on, uh, over Tyre. And now we're in chapter 28, the overthrow of the king. Okay, so I'm just showing you. Um, and so we have this parallel prophecy again. Now I'm in verses 11 through 19. And look, he gives descriptions. I don't see how anybody could think that he's talking about people. There's no king in the whole wide world could ever qualify for this stuff. You understand? I mean, he, he gave them identities that the average guy, and still people read it and go like, well, I don't believe that, Satan. I believe he's talking about the king. You got like, are you kidding? Who in the world? <laughs> oh, jeez. Again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lament over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus saith the Lord. 
Now watch this. Now, again, remember the Old Testament is, and the New Testament deals with parallel prophecies. Are you with me? Man, I think I've, I only got an hour, guys. Just give me a break. Watch what he, how he describes him. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Perfection and perfect? Anybody tells you that been lying to you, right? So, well, you're, you're perfect. You, you know what your head says? I wonder what they want. Right? Uh, you, were Eden, you were in Eden in the garden of God. And then describes it. Describes it. Uh, he describes it. Uh, was in you on the day that you were created. Hmm? He, he's talking about angelic. They were prepared in the day they were created. They were prepared. You were the anointed cherubim. Are you kidding me? <coughs> Who covers and I place you there. You were in the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You know what that was? That was setting on the supreme council of authority in heaven. You were blameless in your ways, blameless in your ways, from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. No, no humans got that deal. By the abundance of your trade, you were uh, internally filled with violence you sinned, and therefore I cast you as profane from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherubim, that he anointed to protect the holiness of God, this guy. From the midst of the stones of the fire, that is the council, your heart was, was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you to the earth ground. I put you before kings that they may see you. And then he goes on and discuss more. Yeah. I don't see how anybody in their right mind cannot understand what he's talking about here. And I'll tell you, there were people that actually saw this and wrote on it. Uh, Dante and the Inferno wrote on this very subject. Uh, Milton in Paradise Lost, right? If you haven't read those, you ought to read them. They're well worth your read rather than trash. That's, you ought to read that stuff. That's some pretty good stuff. Uh, Mr. Farmer, Mr. Farmer loved Paradise Lost. If you ever heard him, if you ever hear him talk a little while, he, he going to talk about Paradise Lost. That was, I mean, he wrote more stuff and, and taught more lessons off of that thing. And, but anyhow. Uh, thrust down to the pit in the, in the shield. A after, uh, let me close out. After the Eternal Life Conference, that's the ELC, after the Eternal Life Conference, Lucifer wanted supreme, wanted sovereign control of the plan of God over the created universe. He wanted to be worshipped as the Most High God. If you want to know a little more about that in human terms, you can read Genesis 14, 17 through 24. After being cast down to the earth, Satan now wants earthly global worship. They got think how many religions he's developed in this world. Huh? You know, they talk about, I don't remember now, eleven major when I went through my training, we 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 had to study eleven major re religions of the world, of which Christianity was one. And uh Maybe you put Christianity, and, and listen, 11 to 1, that would be 10 to 1. I don't know how many there are left. You know, they only talk about three, but there were a lot, and we studied them all over the globe uh, when I was in school. And, I mean, is, I mean, does it, listen, we're just one with one little old gospel, and he's threatened to death. He has to create 10 across the globe. He create and they're and if you look at them, they're spaced out all over the globe. 
they were when we did. We used to study it. When I was with Graham, he had a he had a he had a map on his wall, uh, and our and our we're, we our office our team office was in Atlanta at the airport, and in the office there was this great big map of the world. I mean, a huge map of the world. It had all different color pins on it. Black, red, green, all different kind of colors on it. And they were stuck all over that map. Of course, being the curious person that I am, as soon as I walked in and looked at that, I went, somebody's got to help me with that map. I got to know it before I leave. What's all that about? And um, what I found to be really interesting about that map was certain colors were where he'd been, okay, in the world. There was another color where he wanted to go, and if there was another pin with it, it was because I remember the red pen for sure because there might have been a white pen put up there if that's where Mr. Graham really felt he wanted to go. He felt he go there. If a red pen stuck right next to that white pen, it meant that it was hot, that there was, there was positive volition, that there was a lot, of, a lot of appeal to bring Mr. Graham into that area. And I'll tell you, it was amazing to me to see where those red and white pins were. One of them was in China and one was in Russia. And, and then, the, then they were stuck all over the place. And I was, I was amazed. And I was amazed how many sections of the world, now that, that's back in the 70s when I was with him. I was with him 68 to 72. In that period right there, how many places in the world were hot for the gospel and to send missionaries? And we use that all the time with guys to the churches to, to send missionaries to these places. But um, I promise you, Nothing has changed. And listen, on the other, on the other side of that thing was uh, the map of the United States, which I was really interested in. And he had the same thing on that America. Now, the places where he had been, he only goes to. He would only go to uh, cities that were like uh, two million or three million people. And then guys that were under him would go to cities underneath that down to 500,000. But it amazed me when I saw that picture of America, how many states he had been into major cities, how far he had been. And I was amazed how many white red stick uh, pins were all over um, America. And you know where, you know, where most of the pins were. And I said, well, when did all those pins get up there? The South. The South, he had been all over the South. I mean, he'd been out on the West Coast. It was amazing to me. And, and the pins of people wanting him in was amazing to me. And um, when I saw America hot, I mean, everywhere, it was all over the place. Everything in that period was hot, hot, hot for evangelism. I got really stoked. And I become, I become absolutely, look, I, I, I'm through with my lesson anyhow. Let me tell you something. When I left Mr. Graham, I saw all, I saw all those hot spots. And I saw that the South was really hot. I mean, they had been hot for a long time. We're talking about a, a, a long time. I came back, and Rick Hughes and I, we did, now think about this. We did every high school and junior high and college in the state of Mississippi, and we preached the gospel and gave a come-forward invitation in them. <clears throat> 
we had so many decisions when we saw that when we saw that a large number of kids were getting saved I mean 20 30 percent of the student body would get saved we went to Bob Thiem. we said to Bob can we look we, we need to be able to give something in the hands of these kids that getting saved would you give us the plan of God book would you support our ministry going through Mississippi would you help us with that and we don't want to repent or, or tell us that we have permission to repent, print, repent, reprint that book. Cause that's the ideal book for us to give these kids. And then they can, if they, you know, Bob was always, well, you don't give them anything unless they're volitional. And they're, well, we want to give it. And then if they want to study more, right. Volitionally, they can get more. And, and, and so we met with Bob and, and he gave his permission. We went out there, we hit, by the time we got through one, it took a, we broke the, the state down into three sections. It took us three years. When we got through the first section of the first year, he called us into the office and he said, boys, we can't do this anymore. Your numbers are bigger than ours. And you're only in one year into this. You're going to have to figure a different way to do it because there's no way we could do this. And so... We sat down, and so Rick Hughes sat down. He said, Ron, what, what are we going to do? I said, well, Rick, come up with something. Because I was out setting everything up. I said, come up with something, buddy. And so he came up with a wonderful little booklet that we handed to kids, and so we just added into the, our financial outlay. And do you know, we did all that without any money. We, listen, we, had, we didn't have one dollar to our name. And we went through the state of Mississippi. We blew through the state of Mississippi. We blew holes through that place. And then we went to Georgia. And we, it took us four years to get through Georgia. We were in Georgia four years. We went to every high school. Every, we did them all. I could tell you stories that you would not believe. Then we came to Alabama. And by then, we were getting bigger than life. We were headed for Texas and every place else. It was 1974. And I said, I got to leave you guys. I can't do this anymore. I can't run it. I was the guy who set up everything because I had the knowledge of it. I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to start church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in there and start teaching the word of God. This is what they're missing. You guys carried it on. And so we did that. We brought, we brought Horton in. And uh, the guys along with Hort Horton did the whole city of Birmingham. And the rest of the guys ran through the state of the state of Alabama, and uh, we intended to go through every state in the South before. Then we were wide open, and uh, and then it, it just fell apart. Uh, you know, I, I guess my motivation, my knowledge of how to do it. I trained guys to do it, but they, everybody else kind of, it's kind of fell away. But listen, we can you imagine that? And this was in this. This was in the 70s. We, we did every high school, junior high, and college in three states of the South. I can't begin to tell you how many thousand kids got saved. You can just imagine the numbers when we were running 20 and 30 and more percent. And I'm talking about come forward, and, and we, we interviewed him and did everything. And we, do you believe that Jesus? Yeah, and we went through the whole deal. Then gave him a little booklet and encouraged him to contact Baraka. We could have, we didn't have the funds to do that. Well, anyhow, listen, Angeli conflict. Don't be a victim, be a victor. Let me tell you, people, we need to get on fire again. L look at Horton. When Horton comes home and gives a report, he's walking on water right now. He's walking on water, swimming. I don't know if he can walk anymore, but. <laughs> That old warrior is out there, and I'll tell you, he's, he's seeing young people today on fire for God. He said, I've never seen anything like it. I've hit the gospel so hard with these 3,000 kids he'd been talking to over the summer. He said, I've hit these kids so hard with the gospel, Ron, that even the, even the adults vibrate a little bit with it. And he said, they're on so far. He said, I've got more stacks of paper from these kids telling me they are on fire, and we need to get on it. I mean, yeah, I mean... The young people, I don't know what you're, you know, don't read the newspapers. Just 
spend some time with some young people. Some of these high school kids and, and college kids that, that I meet with every summer, whoa, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, they are on fire for God. They are on fire for God. And I get so excited about it. We need to be prepared to be with them kids. They're on fire for God. I mean, I'd love to see that old map now, boy. That thing probably got a little dry, and I bet it's hotter than a pistol right now if they still do that stuff. Uh, listen, we need to be doing it. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these come our way by automobile and the Internet. We thank you, Father, for all your blessings to our life through Christ, not of herself. Thank you for our visitors, first-timers. Pray it won't be a first-timer. Come study with us. Come study with us. Be prepared for fight the angelic conflict with great, great hope, confidence, authority. Disciples came back. I can't believe the authority of your name. I can't believe we just spoke things in the authority of your name. And they submitted to us. Ah, he said it wasn't to you. Let me tell you, as big as this deal was, nothing's bigger than having your name written in the book of life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're so thankful. It's in Jesus' name that we've prayed. Amen.